I'm Nana van Tilburg for Business and with me is Kurvis Fenter. He's an economist at the Bureau for Economic Research at Stellenbos University. And recently he's been elaborating on pay-as-you-go services and more particularly fiber connection for townships as a pay-as-you-go service. Hi Kurvis, welcome to Business. Thank you very much. Well, very interested to for you to elaborate on this concept of pay-as-you-go. Yes, I... Just a, a bit, a bit of a disclaimer. There, I'm also a consulting economist to Vulacoin and FiberTime, the companies that are are rolling out this this specific um, solution that I that I wrote about. And essentially, it's a way that we were able to use modern fintech um, solutions to bypass an old problem. And and in this case, the the problem was financing of large infrastructure projects. To roll out fiber in the townships, because yeah, you know, it, it, the the idea of having pre-sales and monthly debit debit orders, etc., just doesn't exist. And uh, they created a, a new solution that works on a kind of a, a rollout to everybody, every single user, uh, and then it is dependent on a pay on a on a pure pay-as-you-go model. So the operating system require, is is validated. Um, using the same technology as the payment um, and it also uh, activates the device so the the entire process is seamless and automatic and um, by doing so you are creating a consumer base of everybody in the in the township um, and we had to prove to the financial sector and the banks that by doing this without any pre-sales agreements um, we will generate enough income to make the the solution viable uh, it started a couple of years ago. It's something that's been uh, mulling around for a long time, but the technology finally caught up, and we're now able to do that. And and we're not the only ones doing it. Um, our solution is is probably the biggest one at the moment. But we the whole idea is that others will follow us and and hopefully just copy what we're doing so that we can connect more people. So where is this being rolled out? So our own proof of concept or fiber times proof of concept started in Kalamundi just outside of Stellenbosch um, for the pure convenience of being just next door to our offices or to their offices and um, it's being rolled out into four other townships already the the way leaves and the permissions are in place but Vulaco and the operating system and the payment gateway um, that allows for, for 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 pure pay as you go Fiber is already operative on oh, several dozen other ISPs. Most of them in in proof of concept phase and and limited, but it's it's essentially the biggest user base is in the Western Cape, but it's it's being tested all over the country. Um, we've had inquiries from Zambia, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire um, as well, but we're focusing on South Africa for the moment, um, simply because of of capacity constraints. Um, but hopefully, in the next year, it will be it will be rolled out on on several larger networks as well, uh, which will literally enable people to leapfrog straight into into the modern digital era. So, how does it work? Because if you have other cables, you can steal. If it's copper cables, fiber cables, does it have the same problem? Can people, no. in a way, they're very these thin little cables? Can people steal them? Fortunately, not. But I I think the 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 real challenge that one has to overcome always, apart from your own way of thinking about it, because when you come from a formal, you know, from a formal economy mindset, it's a very different world. Um, and we we went in, we learned a tremendous amount uh, in the community to ensure that there's community buy-in. And it's not that anybody can get it; it's literally everybody gets it. So mm. it it, it, ch- it changes the mindset completely from a uh, I have and you don't, or us and them. Um, to everybody has it. So the fiber connects. The, the fiber lines themselves have no value. It's the, there's nothing in there. Um, but obviously the routers that go into each dwelling. And and when I say dwelling, it's a brick and mortar house or a shack. As long as it's got a legal electricity connection, um, each dwelling gets a gets a router and it has a little embedded UPS device in it as well. So essentially, it does have value. Um, our experience in terms of theft and, and crime has, has been, well, there hasn't been any, uh, simply because everybody has them, so there's no real value in, 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 in stealing yours to give you know, take for myself. Uh, and secondly, when you have the, the needed community buy-in, you're absolutely welcomed into, into the communities, and, and they look after it. Uh, this is something with, with massive 
benefits to the to the end user users. Um, so the, the the protection factor comes from the community itself. We don't have to do much to to protect. Obviously, the the breakout point has some serious machinery in it, and 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 that's secured in a normal way. But for the rest of the network, we've actually had almost no issues whatsoever. Sounds it's, that sounds as though it's working really well. Um, so, what are the key factors to replicate the Kayamundi project and the one that's been successful, you know, around the the, the country? There's very little actually stopping it from being rolled out in other places. Now, as I said, the biggest the, the biggest challenge was getting banks. It's rolling out fiber anywhere, whether you trench it or whether you you use aerial fiber. So in in township. Uh, environments you have to use aerial fiber because there's yeah. simply no space to trench and the, the the densities are so high that you you literally wouldn't be able to make the connection so we we follow similar paths to where the um, overhead electricity power comes from we have to you know they have to plant their own poles and they drop physical fiber lines into each house um, so it, it gets quite it gets quite dense and that's very expensive so initially the the challenge was a being allowed in by the community and then be getting the banks to, to fund that, uh, because typically in your in your leafy suburbs you would have a pre-sales agreement and you'd have to reach a threshold of thirty or forty or fifty percent before the banks would extend the necessary credit for you to go and appoint the local construction crews to go and trench and connect. Um, whereas we we spend all that capital up front with absolutely no guarantee of usage. Uh, we had a metric uh, that made the the operating model sustainable at around sixty percent. Uh, utilization of the network on any given day um, at a at a price point of around five rands a day. Now we've never hit less than eighty four percent utilization on any given day at a price point significantly higher than the five rands, um, simply because more people are connecting than we had anticipated. So it's it's now verifiable. the The financial institutions can come and have a look. We're very open with the whole you know, with what we've done. We we're only one company. We can only connect so many houses in a year. And we're hoping that some of the larger fiber operators will eventually just copy exactly what we're doing. So, what is the cost benefit to um, consumers? It's 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 very hard to explain it because it's completely non-linear. So, when we did a a, a pre-survey um, in our target community to see whether there was enough money available, uh, it turns out that most of our consumers spend around two hundred rands a month on on mobile and connectivity data costs. Now, 200 rands buys you a couple of, of, of gigs of data, you know, three, four, five gigs for the month. Um, whereas ours costs uh, as little as, as 100 rands a month um, for 100 megabytes up and down. It's a, it's a minimum speed of 100 meg. So it's really high quality internet. It's uncapped. And most of our consumers, well, the average consumption is now around one and a half terabytes of data per user. So you compare that half of the cost, um, so 100 Rand versus 200 Rand, um, and you consume instead of 5 gigabytes, you're consuming 1,500 gigabytes. You, you can't really compare the, the, uh, the, the value proposition to the, to the consumer. So that's real wealth generation or wealth creation because the consumer surplus in, in economic speak um, has been enlarged dramatically. The, the real test will be how that, is utilized. So a lot of that will probably be used for, for pure entertainment purposes, you know, watching Showmax or Netflix or, or whatever, um, the odd bit of useless social media. But at the same time, people will access education. They will access better mm. early childhood development aids. Things that, you know, with all due respect, people like us completely take for granted now becomes available and you can watch a video. Um, whereas previously, you might have had, be, you might have been connected to a network somewhere, but you weren't able to actually actually benefit because you were too scared of streaming anything. It it, it, it used up your data too quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's changed behavior completely at um, at the bureau, and I'm not involved in that project. I excuse myself because I'm so so closely involved on the other side. We are studying that phenomenon. We we started with a, with a pre survey. We've done a midpoint survey, and the, the bureau will do an endpoint survey at the end of this. And I think we're in an incredibly unique position where we're going to be able to map exactly the pathways that real broadband penetration alters lives. Um, we decided to, to focus on friction costs, so job search cost, job search duration, et cetera, et cetera, because those, are, those can be measured within a year or a year and a half period. 
but the longer term dynamic benefits in terms of better social outcomes. Um, there's a classic example. One of our one of our first um, users that we connected at the end of last year uh, worked for a call center in Cape Town in Pinelands, and she used to have to travel through to Pinelands using taxis two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, and it cost her nine hundred rands a month. Her employer is not comfortable enough with the quality of her connection that she's allowed to work from home. They they ping the system all the time, and it's completely you know it's it's very credible. So. In addition to saving, so let's say she uses 100 of the 900 rands for her, for her um, connectivity cost, she's saving 800 rands. That's a net benefit. At the same time, she's spending four hours a day extra with her children, and she's at home during the rest of that time. Um, and from a, from a social development point of view, you can't really quantify that because you'll only see that 20 years, 30 years down the line when her children grow up you know, how are they going to be? Are they going to be better educated? Are they going to be less prone towards the, the typical social problems that we have in South Africa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the real, the real value here is that we have a, a massive problem in South Africa in terms of, of exclusion of the vast majority of our people that live in the informal economy. Um, spatial apartheid created a situation where the formal and the informal economy struggled to really overlap um, because of spatial planning in the past. That's a real South African reality. The digital economy doesn't require the physical space and is growing at an exponential rate. So now you're able to allow people to leapfrog all the traditional South African constraints, all the traditional problems that kept them, kind of kept them back. Um, and they have exactly the same benefits as my children and your children have. Um, and we don't know how that's going to play out. I'm, I'm pretty confident it's going to be a hell of a lot better than what we've got at the moment. So I'm, I'm very excited about this. It, 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 uh, it can create a very positive feedback cycle in South Africa as long as the funding part comes into place. Um, and we think we're, we, we've kind of solved for that and, and we're, you know, Kind of, we open the books to anybody who's willing to look. Um, but the bank, the, the banks are buying into it, and uh, we, the the Fiber Time crowd, recently had a, a European DFI um, fin fund make a direct uh, investment into their group because they saw the, the the potential benefits of this. Um, so yes, it's it's a it's a game changer. It's starting now, but it's 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 growing really exponentially. Well, you mentioned buying from the banks, communities. And you mentioned this one case study. So how are businesses feeling about it? How does it make life much easier for them? Well, essentially, any service industry is slowly but surely. So uh, uh, the, the traditional mobile operators in South Africa, when they started in the 90s, they, they had a prepaid business model and they went after the corporate clients. So a corporate signed up, they gave their staff cell phones and they got paid every month on a debit order. It's a lovely moat when you can have it because it, it, it protects the, the company. The reality is as the market matured, more and more people on the networks decided to go more pay as you go. And in, in most cases, I don't know what the, what the current numbers are, but it's the vast majority of consumers now use pay as you go cell phone services. This is exactly the same, the, the, the same principle. But that's, that holds true for pay TV. It holds true for insurance. So uh, we have a situation with your local football clubs. Um, you don't take out insured life insurance for your players on a constant basis because it's too expensive. But when you are traveling by taxi to East London for a league game for a weekend, the risk becomes a lot greater. Maybe then you take out a, a policy just for the weekend. Um, so these are, these are ways that, that is changing you know, kind of the fundamentals of, of how we operate. Capitec was the first one to start doing that in, in the banking sector in South Africa. Instead of monthly bank fees, you have a, a usage fee. It's kind of the same principle. So you've mentioned a couple of sectors. So it's fiber, you've mentioned um, Capitec, banks. What other sectors have, we not have you not mentioned that might be able or services that might be able to have this pay as you go service. Well, the pay as you go service. I, th I think what, what what the model allows is is to create the base. So you're creating an environment of people that can actually partake in the digital economy. 
So after that, it's an enabling factor. Um, and then whatever gets built on the digital economy can, can also be utilized. And I think in the same principle, because again, Vulacoin is able to instantly validate and settle any transactions that, that that happen in this case, as you, as, as there are some some other digital wallets that can do the same same kind of thing. So essentially, it's everything that is digitally available. But from a from a government point of view, for example, this includes identity documents. It includes making appointments for your grade one to go to school, etc., etc., etc. It it create it 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 creates a, a massively improved efficiency um, gain for the economy because in many cases, you know, you can still go to the primary school and hand in your form, but now you have to have it printed at Postnet, as an example, or, or you know, whoever at, at your work you have it printed. You have to fill it in. You take it there. Somebody has to scan it, send it off. Now you can do this all online, get submitted centrally, and it happens in real time. So it, it's not just the pay-as-you-go um fiber business model it's what it enables and and that's the dynamic effect so it's like a positive feedback loop that that gets created by having it in the first place but it, it's really it's like having a foundation to a building what, what gets built afterwards comes up for discussion but you need to have the foundations and they need to be firm enough and to date 60 percent of our population wasn't going to get that anytime soon so you think this could kick start the informal economy just Absolutely. giving everybody um, Fiber. I'm absolutely convinced of it. Firstly, there's the investment as aspect of it. You're now able to invest into areas that were previously uninvestable. So there, there used to be a lot of negativity and a negative press around redlining of of informal economy areas and things like that. And I was I was found that to be quite um, unjust towards the banking sector. It almost felt as if they they did it on purpose, whereas in reality they didn't know how to how, how to measure their risk, and they didn't know what to price their capital on. Um, and what this is showing them is that there is a way to measure it completely and um, there is a way to extract the needed revenue to pay for the investment. You know, it's, 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 it's not a charitable event. And that was one of the other reasons that um, everything we're, we're doing and that I've been fortunate enough to, to be a part of um, is done with an explicit aim of making it financially sustainable and self-sufficient. So the the original kind of idea from 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 the chairman of Fiber Time, Alan of Craig Jr., um, started in Tswane with a, a project to Sizwe, which was free free Wi-Fi for Africa. It started in the Tswane Metropole, um, but it was outside Wi-Fi and it was paid for by by the municipality. Now that became a political um, hot potato at some stage. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure if it's still working, but but the intention of the whole thing, project to Sizwe, is absolutely still working. Um, and uses Vulacoin now to make their own hotspots financially sustainable. So the nice thing about this is you're no longer reliant on the government to solve this problem. And, you know, typically um, when the free market applies its mind and has the ability to, to validate and price for an investment, the investment can follow because, you know, it's, it's an informed decision then. But it was unreasonable to think the banks must invest money if they didn't know where, how they would how would how they would realise a return. So, how does this model align with the government's digital inclusion initiatives? Um, we were fortunate, for example, that the the breakout points are five times um, backhaul providers, Liquid Telecom, and Liquid had a a, a fibre backhaul line, which was part of the government's rollout. I'm not sure if it's the national or the provincial governments. Um, but there was there was an access point into into the backhaul of internet, which obviously is what you need, which we could tap into quite easily. And and I think it can work symbiotically. I, I think the more government does, the easier it's going to be for the private sector. But I also think that kind of it would be by in the sky to think that government can solve for this. The government has massive massive needs um, and very limited fiscal space, and frankly limited technical capability and capacity in something like this. It's a very, very um, technologically complex environment um, and you need to do that as as efficiently as possible, which means that the profit motive, when, you, when your model says you can spend X on it and you spend X plus one, you go out of business. 
government doesn't work like that, but the private the private industry does. And um, what we're hoping for is that the more people do this, the more companies that do this, the unit price will come down, and you know the same amount of capital can now can now be extended towards more people. So you so get a positive feedback. So what is it? What are the obstacles to roll this out to everybody in summer? People to put up the fiber poles and string them, and splice them. That's that's been a bit of a challenge. No, I mean that's tongue in cheek. I, I I think the biggest the biggest challenge will be um, financing still, uh, getting companies that are entrenched in the fiber business already that have the skills to actually rejig their networks more towards a pay-as-you-go system than a prepaid or postpaid system. Um, it does imply some short-term risk uh, because you, you're essentially potentially on their networks they can charge more for a short-term pay-as-you-go solution but you used to have the you used to have the security of a monthly debit order um, so there is that, that that transitioning risk uh, the reality is it's coming anyway um, so you know the sooner they the sooner they pivot towards that the better that's that's probably the the, the single biggest structural risk and of course the the other real one is that you need municipal permission um, to plant poles and to string fiber, you, you, you need that process. Um, so far, we've been very fortunate to have very understanding local authorities that we've dealt with. Um, we're heading into four new into four new areas as we speak, um, not just Western Cape based. Uh, then we're doing a, a large township outside of Kiberka, uh in January, and. It's the same reception, so so you do have those issues. Um, at the bank so far, we had a, a long process until we got our T Triple P, the third party payment provider status through a local bank uh, or issuing bank. Very happy to. I'm not, I'm not sure if I should name names, but you know they know who they are. We're very grateful for them. Um, and it was it was difficult to start, but now that it's working, it's very easy to show everybody how it works. And then, of course, the main thing is community buy-in. Um, the community must want you there because otherwise they'll never allow the construction. Remember, in, 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 in a township environment where you've got this incredible density, if, that, if, if the people don't want you there, they're not going to let you in, which means your whole project stops before it even starts. Um, as I said, so far, our, our kind of experience with that has been kind of life-affirming, if I can put it like. Thank you for speaking to Business News. Thank you very much.